On this week's episode of Local Matters of PAC TV, Julie dives in with Monica Pepe of the Whale and Dolphin Conservation USA. Government stories you may have missed on Snapshot, In the Know, All About Rice, and events and resources in our South Shore towns. I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. Let's get started. Round Pond in Duxbury features an 18,000-year-old kettle hole at its center, surrounded by beautiful pine and oak forests. These woods offer three miles of hiking trails that are intersecting and well-marked, perfect for a dog walk or family hike. It just so happens that Monday, May 2nd, is a half day of school in Duxbury, and the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society invite you to the Round Pond Family Hike and Dog Walk from 1 to 3 p.m. After you enjoy the exercise and outdoors, there will be lemonade and cookies provided by the Historical Society. This event is free and open to the public, but donations are always appreciated. For more information, visit the Duxbury Rural Historical Society website. Whales are one of the most majestic creatures on this planet, and the coast of Massachusetts one of the best places to see them from. Julie Thompson spoke with Monica Pepe of the Whale and Dolphin Conservation USA to talk about the ways whales can be watched, respected, and protected. I'm pleased to welcome today Monica Pepe, who is the policy manager and in conservation and education for the whale and dolphin conservation. That's a mouthful. Can you talk to me about what, what is this organization and how are you involved in it? Yeah, so uh, my name is Monica and uh, our organization is a nonprofit, so whale and dolphin conservation. Uh, our North American office is based right here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. But we are an international nonprofit, so we have offices in different countries throughout the world. And our, our mission is basically in our name. Our goal is to conserve whale and dolphin populations worldwide. And primarily we do that through a couple of different lines of work that include science, policy, and outreach. So we're trying to use sound science or collect data and, and do research to inform our um, policy efforts to increase protections for whales and dolphins, and then also conduct outreach to a variety of different audiences to get engaged in the work that we're doing and support our efforts. Excellent. Uh, how long has this organization been, um, been around? We have been around for over 30 years. Okay. We were established back in the 80s, and our office here in Plymouth has been around for a shorter time. We've been here since 2005. So oh. relatively new, um, but also pretty well established here yeah. in town. Yeah. There's a million different subjects we can talk about with whales and dolphins, but one of the things that you really wanted to stress was um, people's interaction with them in boats, watercraft. What do you do when you see a whale? How do, how do you know that whales are around? So let's talk about the guidelines and the regulations that are in place right now for operating watercraft around a whale. Yeah, it's a, a great topic to cover. And I first want to just mention, because uh, not a lot of people know this, but all of the whales and dolphins and marine mammals that we have off of the coast here in Massachusetts are actually protected by federal law. So essentially what that law says is that you can't take any actions that would harass, harm, disturb, um, injure these marine mammals. So all of the guidelines and regulations that are in place for operating around whales and dolphins are in that context, that they are meant to actually help boaters to make sure that they're not violating that federal law that protects the animals. Okay. So... For most of the species that we have here, there are guidelines in place. So they are just recommendations for um, steps that boaters and, and other vessel operators can take. Basically what it comes down to is keeping a safe distance from, from the animals. And I should mention too, just from the start here that these guidelines um, are also a really good way to keep boaters safe because many of the animals that we have here in these waters are actually larger than a lot of the vessels that are out there. So when you, you know, put, put those two large things in the same area at the same time, it can be really dangerous for everybody involved. So it's in everybody's best interest to be following the guidelines. 
a lot of the guidelines involve keeping a safe distance. So for most species that we have here in Massachusetts waters, it's recommended to stay 100 feet or more away from, from these animals. So we have humpback whales that uh, a lot of times are, are the subject of, of whale watchers because mm -hmm. they are pretty fun to watch. Um, they're pretty easy to spot as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit, I think. Um, but it is important to keep that, that distance. They are still wild animals. They can be very unpredictable. So maintaining that distance of about 100 feet is, is uh, the baseline recommendation there. You also want to make sure that your operations are not altering the animal's path. So trying not to approach the whales head on if you're trying to, to watch the whales. Um, you don't wanna cut off their path because then that causes them to alter their behavior and then that actually becomes illegal under those protections that I just mentioned. The one um, additional thing on top of this though, there are increased protections for the North Atlantic right whale, mm. which is a critically endangered species. And you know, I'm talking to you right now in mid-April, we have, we've had almost half of the population of North Atlantic right whales in Cape Cod Bay already this year. So our, our coast is a very important area for them. So we wanna make sure that people are also aware, first of all, that they're here. Right. And second of all, that for this species, there's actually a federal regulation in place for, for operating around whales. So it is required, it's enforceable that boaters uh, have to stay 500 yards away from North Atlantic right whales. Um, and also right now there's a 10 knot speed restriction for any vessels uh, in Cape Cod Bay as well. So slowing down speed, keeping a safe distance, um, all of these things, if, if followed uh, closely enough, yeah. will lead to fewer risks of collisions between boats and whales. Now, you, you said you shouldn't go over 10 knots um, and you need to stay um, certain distances away from them. How do you know that they're there? I mean, what, what, what are the signs that there's a whale nearby or there's whales nearby? Great question. And that is part of the problem is that the whales don't always make it easy to know when they're there. Um, whales are mammals, so they are air breathers. They have to come up to the surface to take a breath of air at some point. That being said, they can also hold their breath for a really long time. So uh, this area is not too deep, but these animals are capable of holding their breath for sometimes a half hour at a time. Wow. So even if you're keeping an eye out and looking for them, yeah. you might not see them for a long time. But again, they will always come up at some point. The easiest thing to look for is actually that breath they take. So because their lungs are so large, they're exhaling a lot at one time. And that typically for most species produces a, a visible exhale, which we call a blow yeah. or a spout. Yeah. If it's a really clear day, you can actually see that blow from miles away. So that's gonna be the best thing to start looking for from a distance. Um, other signs that might indicate whales are around include the presence of a lot of birds. Um, for, for some of the species, the birds are trying to feed on the same bait fish that the whales are. Mm -hmm. So if you see a lot of bird activity, that could be a sign that you have feeding whales nearby. And um, some of the, the species here also will raise their tails out of the water when they're going on a dive. So the humpback whale is known for this. And the North Atlantic right whales do this as well. So if you just kind of see a, a tail coming Whoops. up above above the surface <laughs> and then disappearing. There she blows. Yeah. Exactly. Now, yeah. do, do whales often travel in, in is it pods? They, 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 they're not singular swimmers. They, they are with other whales, correct? It's both, actually. Uh, they are known to, to form larger groups. Usually that happens for a short amount of time. So it is actually pretty common to see whales in individually, one-on-one. -on -one. So you might just see one whale, but a lot of times there are at least other whales in an area. Mm -hmm. So while they not might not be really close together, it's a pretty good chance that if you're seeing one whale, there's probably others that are within a couple of miles away. Right, and is there any any um, place you can go like online to, to, to be notified that, hey, we know there's a bunch of right whales here or we, there was a spotting here, so that if people want to plan a day out to go, to go actually see them, um, they, can, they can know that they're in the area? It's a great question. And um, the only whales that are tracked that closely are the North Atlantic right whales. Uh, there are a lot of research efforts trying to monitor the population and figure out where they're going. 
I will say from a vessel, um, trying to watch right whales from 500 yards away can be tough because yeah. it, it really is a long distance. It's basically sure. five football fields long. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you can't see much. Your, your best odds, your best odds for trying to watch right whales is actually from shore. And um, that is definitely possible this time of year uh, along the coast of, of Manomet. I know a lot of people will head out to Manomet Point mm -hmm. out on the Cape as well. And so there is a website called whalemap.org. And on that website, you'll see uh, it's an interactive map, so you can adjust the settings and the time frame and everything. But you can see everywhere from Canada down to Florida where right whales have been seen within the last two weeks. So uh, folks here in Massachusetts can zoom in along our coastline and take a closer look at where whales have been seen. Okay, great. And one of the things before I asked my last two questions was you said that you, you, know, you want to keep a distance between your watercraft and the whale. I know I've been on a couple whale watches where they literally come right next to the boat. So if, if that happens, people should do what? If you're in your own watercraft. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about whales is that they will do whatever they want. <laughs> and so a lot of times that means that they will come closer, which as a, a, you know, an avid whale watcher is a great thing when it happens, but it is important to make sure that that's still being done safely. So if you're a vessel operator, you're following the guidelines, you stop 100 feet away from a whale and it comes closer to you, <laughs> the best thing to do in that scenario is just to cut your engines and yeah. sit in neutral until the whale moves away again. Yeah. So sometimes the whale might, like you were motioning, go just dive under your boat and come up on the other side and continue on. Yeah, um, That's perfectly fine. Yeah, Every so often, it's a really curious whale that wants to kind of check you out a little bit. It might kind of <laughs> circle the boat, you know, yeah. take a look before we're wandering off. So. If that ever were to happen, um, yeah, the best thing to do is just to sit there in neutral, make sure you don't have any spinning propellers when the whale's yeah. that close, and um, just kind of let the whale do its thing. And, then and enjoy being near it, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, what is what is the importance of, of, of whales in the actual, in the ecosystem of, of the oceans? I love this question. I love talking about it. Um, it's something that probably most people have never thought of before. So uh, allow me to introduce you to um, whale poop, basically. Um, so whales uh, are play this really important role in the ocean ecosystem by defecating. And um, we'll take a little bit of a walk through, through the ecosystem here. So um, there are plant-like creatures in the water called phytoplankton. And they actually are responsible for giving us more than half of the oxygen that we as humans breathe. So it's, it's definitely important. Obviously, we have trees on land that are also contributing to that oxygen supply, but um, the oceans make up a larger portion of our planet. So these oceanic plants are, are really vital to uh, providing that oxygen um, and absorbing carbon from, from the atmosphere. So the way that whales come into this is that when they're defecating, they are putting a lot of nutrients back out into the marine environment, which is fertilizing that phytoplankton. So, um, you know, when you think about how big whales are, they're defecating quite, quite a good amount. Um, they're also doing this at or near the surface of the water. There's actually too much pressure at deeper depths for them to be able to go. So they're always coming up towards the surface which is also where we're finding this phytoplankton because they need sunlight just like plants on land. So it's becoming a really productive environment for phytoplankton whenever you have whales that are releasing those nutrients. And that's actually what our area is known for. If you're ever looking through the water and it looks green, mm. it's because of all the phytoplankton that we have here off the coast of Massachusetts. So that's the base of the entire uh, marine food chain, Who and that? whales that's... are the ones responsible for fertilizing it. Wow, that's that's incredible. I bet 99.9% .9 of the people don't know that. That was That's really interesting. Now, how can people get involved in, in the conservation efforts for both whales and dolphins? There's a lot of different ways, but since we're, we're talking about um, boating around whales, I will mention um, that a lot of times it is recreational boaters who are reporting entangled whales that they come across or injured whales that they might happen to see um, while they're out on the water. And this is a really important way to help researchers monitor these um, sometimes endangered populations. So as a boater, the best thing that you could do is to call in our local hotline for reporting these kinds of things. 
um, again, entangled whales, you know, that are, have some sort of line wrapped around them, um, an injured whale, you're seeing like blood in the water, fresh injuries, those, those are animals that we'd want to know about. So uh, the hotline for our area is 866-755-6622. And I would highly recommend anyone who is boating in this area to just save that hotline number in your phone before you head out on the water. If you lose cell phone reception, you can always radio the Coast Guard on channel 16. Mm -hmm. But reporting those sightings is a really easy way for boaters who are already out there seeing these animals to report that information and, and try to get some help uh, over to those to those whales. Excellent. Um, and then aside from that, I will talk at length, but um, we have a lot of different ways that people can get involved in supporting the work that we do to help protect whales and dolphins. So I would just encourage everybody to check out our website at whales.org for more information on how to do that. Absolutely. And there's so much interesting stuff on that website, especially the inflatable whale you have. I just love that. I think we, we did a story about that a long, long time ago. That's really that's really a neat a neat thing for kids, especially to learn about whales. Uh, Monica, thank you so much. This is so interesting and fascinating, and perfect time wise because we're getting into that season where the boaters are going out there and the whales are around. So, um, good luck to you. Continue your mission. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. To learn more about WDC, visit us.whales.com. Org. Every spring, towns on the South Shore and across the country gather together to clean up their neighborhoods, protecting wildlife from the dangers of human litter, enhancing natural beauty, and building hometown pride and community. On May 7th at 10 a.m., join Plymouth Pride for Hometown Cleanup Day. You'll meet at Granite City Electric Supply at 3 Industrial Park Road in Plymouth. Make sure to wear your favorite rainbow gear. Bring any gloves and trash pickers you may have. Plymouth Pride will provide the rest. Visit the Plymouth Pride Facebook page for more information. One of the fastest growing sports in the country is pickleball. With a mix of ping pong, tennis, and several other racket and paddle sports, this game is a great medium impact way to burn off calories and meet new friends. On April 26, from 8 to 10 a.m., head to the pickleball courts on Route 53 in Duxbury for Duxbury Recreation's Adult Pickleball Clinic. This two-hour clinic will include one hour of drills, followed by an hour of facilitated play, coached by pickleball instructor Cindy Reagan. Players are asked to bring their own paddles and their game face. To register, visit the Duxbury Recreation Facebook page. Next up is Mark McKinley with an all-new Snapshot. Welcome to Snapshot, where we take a local look at the government stories that you may have missed. The application window for housing aid covered by the Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Dollars ended on April 15th. But those in need can still turn to the state-funded Residential Assistance for Families in Transition program for help. Households can complete an online application through Mass.gov, through the Office of Housing and Economic Development, or by calling 877-211-6277 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Interpreter services are available in multiple languages. Trustees for the University of Massachusetts approved the first raise in tuition costs in three years for the state's four undergraduate campuses, responding to inflation and other expected cost increases. UMass undergraduate students will see a 2.5% jump in tuition for the 2022-2023 academic year, along with an increase in room and board costs between 1.9 to 3.9%. $120 million in state funding shared between four Massachusetts public colleges and universities will be used to boost student capacity and expand instruction in STEM courses. Salem State University, Massasoit Community College, Springfield Technical Community College, and UMass Lowell will receive $30 million each for capital projects designed to reshape campuses or modernize facilities. 
State Attorney General Mara Healey announced that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will receive $525 million to abate the opioid crisis. These funds are part of a national $26 billion settlement with the largest drug distributors who manufactured and profited from opioid distribution. This money will flow into Massachusetts over the next 18 years, beginning this spring. Of those funds, $210 million will go directly to Massachusetts communities, and more than $310 million will be applied to statewide recovery efforts, including harm reduction, treatment, and prevention. Locally, the town of Duxbury received over $786,000. The town of Kingston received over $287,000. The town of Pembroke received over $712,000. And the town of Plymouth, over $2.2 million. The town of Kingston wants your input on open space use, management, and goals through a survey on the town's website. This survey is a requirement and the steps to update the town's open space and recreation plan, a project currently in progress. The survey runs until April 30th and will take less than five minutes to complete. Find it on the town's website, kingstonma.gov. The town of Pembroke has applied to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Water Management Act program for an amendment to its existing permit to add Swanberg Whale Field, located off of Pleasant Street, as an additional source to the town's drinking water supply. MassDEP has approved 37 million gallons per day, and no increase in overall withdrawal is requested. The average annual withdrawal of water would remain at the level that is currently permitted by Mass DEP, which is 0.71 million gallons per day. The water withdrawal provides potable water for the town of Pembroke. A copy of this water withdrawal permit application is available for review at the town clerk's office at Pembroke Town Hall during normal business hours, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Written comments on the granting of a Mass DEP permit for this withdrawal are required to be filed by April 28, 2022. Thanks for watching this edition of Snapshot. I'm Mark McKinley, and we will see you next time. Create something beautiful and relieve stress while you do it. Starting Wednesday, May 4th, the Pembroke COA will host Inspire Education Class, Evening Art. Art and recreation owner Julie Quill leads this eight-week course where you'll create three of your own artworks using acrylic paint. Bring a favorite photo to inspire your painting or choose a picture from a book provided by the instructor. Julie will teach some art history along the way as she guides you in your artistic growth. To register, call the COA at 781-294-8220. The Weston Wind Quintet was formed in 1967 by first chair woodwind players of the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra. They've presented dozens of concerts in the greater Boston area, and now they're coming to Plymouth. On Monday, May 9th, you are invited to a free concert at the Plymouth Public Library, where you'll hear the beautiful works of composers such as Anton Reha, Anatole Lerdoff, Jennifer Higdon, and Miguel Del Aguila. The show begins at 7 p.m. To learn more, visit the Plymouth Public Library website. Is your schedule crammed with everything but time for yourself? Consider making a commitment to you time with yoga class on Gray's Beach in Kingston. On Saturdays from May 21st to June 11th, join the Kingston Recreation Department and instructor Tori Best for 8 a.m. yoga class on the beach, where you'll practice mindful movement by stretching, strengthening, and giving yourself permission to pause. Bring a mat, blanket, or towel, whether you're a beginner or a yogi. All are welcome. To register, visit the Kingston Recreation website. The Pembroke Public Library Book Club meets on the first Tuesday of each month, and their next read is The Last Apothecary by Sarah Penner. The book is initially set in the winter of 1791, when a female apothecary secretly doles out poison to women to use to free themselves from the men who've done them wrong. Centuries later, an aspiring historian finds an old vial near the River Thames and uncovers haunting deaths that plagued London hundreds of years before.
The next book club meets on May 3rd from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. For more information or to request a copy of the book, call 781-293-6771. Plymouth Public Schools is proud to host this year's Health and Safety Fair on Saturday, April 30th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Plymouth North High School. The school district will be joining with community partners to share information about healthy eating, physical activity, health services, and other local wellness and safety resources to families in Plymouth. There will also be free parent and caregiver workshops, entertainment, and activities for kids. This event is free and open to all ages. Just next door, and also from 10 to 2, the Plymouth Youth Development Collaborative will be hosting a drug take-back event at the Plymouth Center for Active Living. Drop off unwanted medications, sharps, and vapes. There will also be free resource kits and deterra pouches to dispose of meds at home. For more information, visit the Plymouth Youth Development Collaborative Facebook page. Regardless of your status or geographical location, rice is a vital food in diets around the world. But do you know how this tiny grain gained such a giant food profile? Learn more as we revisit In the Know, all about rice. Rice, you eat it all the time. Whether it's in your sushi or just in a big bowl covered with butter, this handy grain is the culinary heart of many a culture. But have you ever thought about where it came from? In this installment of In the Know, you're going to learn all about the little bits of grainy stuff, including the history of its cultivation and usage in different parts of the world. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn some things. Webster's Dictionary defines the word rice as the starchy seeds of an annual Southeast Asian cereal grass that are cooked and used for food. Wait, what's a cereal grass? No, no, that can't be it. Ah, wait, it's a type of grass that grows kernels on top of the stalk. That makes more sense. There are, of course, many parts of the world that grow rice. We could get into all the places, but we'd be here all day, and really, who has time for that? Let's start with China. Rice goes back to about 10,000 years ago. As the Ice Age began to melt away and transition into the current geological period we know today, a group of hunter-gatherers near China's Yangtze River began changing their way of life. They started growing rice. Eventually, it became domesticated and spread to all parts of Asia. By the time of the Zhao Dynasty in 1100 BC, rice had not only become a dietary essential, but it had become an economic staple as well, and has remained that way for centuries. China is currently the world's largest producer of rice, making up 30% of the global rice population. That's a lot of rice. Rice is also woven into the fabric of Chinese culture. At the time of the Qin Dynasty in 221 BC, rice was used to brew wines for celebrations and offered as a sacrifice to the gods. Guess that's better than using humans. China still uses rice for important milestones and holidays. For example, rice is a central part of the Chinese Lunar New Year's Eve dinner. Chinese families will make a cake called gao, which is a steamed sponge cake that turns flour into lovely glutinous rice. Families eat these particular cakes in hopes for a better future. Maybe we could all use a little gao in our lives. You may have never thought of Italy as being mysterious, but how rice got to the boot of Europe? Well, that is a mystery. Hmm. There are many ways rice could have arrived in Grand Old Italia. Rice could have been brought by crusaders, or from Middle Eastern travelers in Sicily, or maybe Venetian merchants brought it back from India, or it could have been brought by an army of aliens looking to barter for pasta. Just kidding, I made that up. Whatever the case, rice is important to Italy in terms of cuisine and in economy. And Italians were actually pioneers of the rice-making game. Although rice goes way back in this country, the most important period for Italian rice cultivation started in the 19th century, when the farmers of the province of Vercelli came together to open one of the most effective irrigation systems in history. They built a well, which flooded the fields to protect crops from extreme temperature changes between day and night. It was a ton of work, but don't worry, they got a canal later. Go Vercelli! Today, Italy is the largest producer of rice in all of Europe. Italy produces around 1.3 million tons of rice each year, 53% of which are exported to other European countries. The regions of Lombardy and Piedmont are known as Italy's rice bowl. The most popular delicacy is a little rice dish you might know and love, risotto, which is part of Italy's national heritage, a significant product in the Italian economy. Risotto usually is preferred as the first course over pasta. Ah. 
In Venice and Veneto, risotto with sautéed eels is served as a traditional Christmas meal. In hearing all about how rice got to other countries, you may be asking yourself how it got here in the U.S. of A. Well, like many things in life, it happened by complete accident. In 1685, a ship was heading to Madagascar. Where was the ship from? No idea. But it had just undergone some trauma from a storm and hobbled itself into Charlestown Harbor, located into what was known as the Carolina Colony. Being the gracious folks they were, the colonists took the ship's crew in and even helped them repair their ship. To repay them for their kindness and hospitality, the crew gave a local planter a small amount of golden seed rice. Quickly, the colonists realized the marshlands and rivers in the Carolinas and in Georgia were perfect spots for growing this new and multi-talented crop. By the 1720s, the area produced 4,500 tons of rice. And when America finally gained independence from those silly Brits, rice became one of the major agricultural businesses and fueled the economy of a new nation. From its humble beginnings in the Carolinas, rice has become a major agricultural product in the U.S. Nearly 90% of the rice consumed here is actually produced here. And it's not only used for our food, but it's also used for brewing beer, making pet food, and of course the occasional snap I dropped my phone in the toilet incident. Don't worry, we've all been there. So the takeaway, rice is important to humans. Not only is it extremely versatile, but it also helps sustain two thirds of the world's population. And it's also a part of all of our cultures. I mean, what would you throw at weddings if rice didn't exist? Beef jerky? Ew, gross. So the next time you venture down the rice aisle at your local grocery store, think about the people, places, and events that made this multifaceted grain what it is today. For more In The Know's and other amazing content, like and follow the local scene on Facebook, Insta, and Twitter. This has been In The Know, all about rice. Now you're in the know. And that wraps this episode of Local Matters. Visit the local scene on YouTube, social media, or our website for more of what's good and good to know in our community. From all of us at PAC TV, have a safe and happy week. We will see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.